Welcome to our little presentation on limiting barriers to youth employment. We have people today from all walks of life. Uh, I am Evie Stormheart. I live in Anchorage area, and I'm a youth advocate, journalist, and tech specialist. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Crystal Tomayor. My pronouns are they, them, and AJ in Spanish. Um, I am the bilingual program coordinator for San Diego Pride. I oversee our youth and Latina programs. And my name is Dejanae Hale. I use she, her pronouns. I am the program's manager of youth leadership with Point Source oh. Youth. And I am the youth support specialist with the Alaska Coalition on Housing and Homelessness. And I get the pleasure of overseeing um, these awesome youth action boards and get to work with awesome young people. And I'll kick it over to Andrew. Hey everyone, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes, oh my gosh. I appreciate folks' patience. Um, hi everyone, I'm Andrew Gutierrez III. I go by he, him, or they, them. I am the Director of Youth Leadership and Advocacy here at Point Source Youth, and I'm located in San Francisco. And I have the pleasure of working with Dejeuner in supporting our Point Source Youth um, Advisory um, Council, as well as supporting other YABs across the country. Uh, and I'll go pass it on to our next speaker. And we just want to give um, the audience a chance to introduce themselves. And I see that folks were able to introduce themselves um, while we were having a couple tech issues. <laughs> um, but if you if you haven't already, please just drop your name, pronouns, agencies, um, where you're currently located, probably where you're uh, born and raised. And then we also wanted to ask it, ask a few check-in questions. Um, we do have three questions here displayed, but we just wanted to give y'all a choice. Um, our first question is, what was your first job? Um, and then what was your most memorable job? Um, or if it wasn't an employee or if it was a contract, um, kind of, you know, what was your first avenue of making consistent income? And then our last question that we thought would be interesting to hear back from folks is how did you balance affording to pay for living expenses, rent, um, eating quality meals, covering health costs, et cetera? Um, this I'm most interested in hearing because um, affording to live these days is like crazy um, as we all are experiencing um, post pandemic. Um, so yeah, I just want to give you guys a few um, moments to answer that. And um, Evie, you can kick us off to the next slide. So our first area is uh, learning objectives and what we're trying to teach here. Just introducing the whole, stu uh, whole slideshow, I guess. And so today's session topic and objectives for today's training is this session will explore how to hire and support young people in full-time positions. As folks are aware, many organizations ac across the country are looking to hire more um, young people with lived experience. However, they are facing many challenges as well as experiencing a lot of successes. And so this training, we're hopefully um, going to be able to highlight some of those challenges as well as the successes that we've been seeing across the country. We're also um, going to learn how to ensure your organization is valuing the lived experience um, by modifying your hiring practices, as well as examining how applications, the application and the selection process can be exclusionary. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and dive in today um, around a, um, some ideas on how to modify some of these practices, how to make sure that your selection and application process is more trauma informed. Today's session objectives are one, how to improve practices around hiring young people with lived experience. Two, how to modify org policies and, and procedures to be youth-centered and trauma-informed. Three, how to include youth leadership and voice within the hiring and application process. And four, how to identify the assets as well as the value of hiring youth with lived experience. 
So this is a lot. Obviously, we have uh, a little over um, an hour, so we're super excited to dive into these objectives today. Slide. So here's a couple definitions, some key terms that uh, we think is important to know when hiring uh, youth from maybe a diverse background or just who have issues, disabilities, or different ways of doing things. So we have trauma-informed, which is when you're aware of someone's traumas, triggers, factors that make them a person, but also may take some time to get used to, or maybe things you should just not approach them about, things you should not talk about or things you should delicately talk about because sometimes things can be very triggering. Trauma-informed care is when you encourage support and treatment of the whole person, you don't focus on individual aspects. You see them as having all these aspects in one, but not a single, a single box does not define the person. Next, we have youth-centered, also known as youth-centered care, which is where you approach with a more young person mindset. You approach to help young people, not just people. People are different and diverse and just everywhere on any spectrum. We're in a galaxy of people. And so you're going to meet so many different groups, so many different Diversity is great stuff. Um, authentic youth engagement, creating a positive environment to help grow and add to youth skill sets. You are giving them the tools they need to be successful in life. It, it's not just what a lot of what I see in uh, Walmart, Fred Meyers, shopping stores, all this is we give you money and you just do your job. That's what they want. But really, it's also about the, the youth growing and becoming a better person and learning how to do multiple jobs so they can move on and better their own lives. Anybody else have anything to add? Anything else? No. Nope. Next slide. Okay. All right. So, uh, leadership and professional development awareness. Um, so, I think a lot of us think of leadership in a very specific way, right? We think of like great speakers. We think of people that can move a crowd. We think of people that can make decisions during difficult times. Yes, that is leadership. And also, when we are looking at hiring young people, when we want to instill leadership, is that we want to give them a sense of solidity within themselves and their skill set, right? So leaders don't necessarily necessarily have to be public speakers. Leaders don't necessarily have to be the most outgoing um, or social people around, right? Um, but if you can get a young person to engage with their skill set, to feel confident in a work environment, to use that skill set to contribute um, either like with the organization that they're in and then take that skill set outside of the organization, that's building leadership, right? Um, so when we think about professional development, a lot of times we think of like, how is your Excel skills or all that kind of stuff? Like, how well do you interview? Um, but uh, like Evie said, it's, it's taking a holistic, a whole person approach to the folks that we're working with um, and really looking at their skill set as something not just to use for the quote unquote gain of our organization, but also to contribute to that person's success in their life. Um, Cause right, like none of us are free until all of us are free. We all build upon each other's greatness. Um, so in looking at that more um, person-centered model, mm -hmm. it's a, we need to see le leadership and personal development or professional development a little bit differently. 
Um, and then connectivity versus systems. So I think a lot of you too work in nonprofits. Um, and if you if your organizations are like my organization, there's a system for everything on the planet. Um, and I get it, they're important. We need those systems, right, for like efficiency to make things run smoothly so that we don't lose the receipts, blah, 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 all those kind of things. Um, but when you give more value to the necessity of systems than, than the necessity of connectivity, you, you lose the person and you're also, you're losing a valuable asset that mm. we forget is an asset because all we see is the system, right? So a person's humanity and their ability to connect with you, with your organization and with the folks that you are serving, if you're in a serving capacity, that is more valuable than maintaining the system. Um, so for those of you that are looking at hiring youth, that means that you have to take a critical examination of the systems that are in your organization, nonprofit, whatever it may be, and evaluate how those systems are either promoting the holistic person or causing more harm. Mm. Right. So like as a quick little example, um, if you are working with a young person who really struggles with meeting timelines, so uh, like, let's say that you have a young person that um, struggles with timelines, but they have told you like, hey, sometimes I can't focus, but I have these outbursts of concentration and I can get done five hours of work in two hours. I just don't know when that happens. Then you might look at your system instead of giving them a weekly assignment. You might say, by the end of this month, I need these three main tasks completed from you and you can do them at your discretion in the order that you desire, but this is what needs to be accomplished, right? So it just takes you having a different eye to the systems that you have in place to ensure that the connectivity of your like organization in general and the people that you're working with is not lost. Thank you so much, Chris, for mentioning that, because that also reminds me. I mean, that's just so powerful to bring and just to remind us of this framework, because a lot of the young people earlier today in our plenary were mentioning something like this. Right. Focusing more on the person, um, focusing on that human connection versus this system. And, and, and a lot of these systems that we're operating from have been harmful. Right. So I thank you so much for bringing in this framework and this definition into this training So now we're going to after so since we were able to basically have a foundation we wanted to set up and provide those key definitions as well as key terms because now we're going to be talking about how to implement um trauma informed as well as youth centered hiring practices. I think that there was a question in the slide in regards to are we talking about after hiring or during the hiring process and we're actually talking about both. So you will hear us throughout this presentation talk about when we are preparing to hire and outreach um, as well as after or and when we select the person to then after the person is hired and how we're actually supporting them within our organization. So it's an and. Slide. Thank you, Andrew and Chris and Evie for um, getting us started. Chris, I love how you articulated that message, the connection, um, the connectivity versus systems. Um, that is our first um, strategy that we'll, we will be talking about. Um, so strategy one is human connection, recovery and connectivity, healing centered approaches. Um, so we do have some questions um, that we're going to be asking the audience just to hear feedback on what you guys are currently doing and maybe just to get the, the, the wheels turning and things that maybe you can be implementing. Um, so I want to ask you guys, how can organizations modify their policies and procedures to be youth centered and trauma informed? And feel free to drop those answers um, in the chat. We do have folks monitoring them um, as we go through the presentation. And now we can get into the bulk of this is, um, as I'm gonna be going, I'm gonna also be asking you guys questions um, while I'm explaining this is like, I just wanna kick us off is uh, for directors who are looking to hire young people is 
something to think about is has that young person addressed their trauma and are they willing to address it to an extent that it doesn't interfere with their ability to serve others? Um, a lot of this work can be re-traumatizing. It's hard. We get bogged down. Um, sometimes we have we need breaks, right? As staff. Um, also, do they know what their triggers are? Most people that do have trauma do have triggers, and this is something that um, needs to be communicated to their team during the onboarding process to avoid triggers. And if there are triggers that do take place, the person can share that with the team. Um, and this is important because it teaches the young person that they do have the support and they are not alone um, when onboarding. Um, part of overcoming trauma is recognizing triggers and offering um, opportunities for coping tools. Um, so a young person does have the ability to choose tools that they're able to cope with or that work for them. Um, are they able to use some peer support strategies to walk away with someone or to walk along with someone who also needs help? Or is someone else's trauma too much for them and their scope of their work, right? So these are things to be really thinking about when you are gonna hire a young person with lived experience. Um, some people can manage their own trauma, um, but others cannot. And being thoughtful if they overcome trauma and being able to create a non-judgmental space for those still in their trauma is super important, right? Because we are serving other young people. Um, and then the transformation piece, like, I feel like I've been saying trauma a lot, <laughs> but <laughs> people in trauma, they grow and they also grieve simultaneously, right? So while we're still in our trauma, we're still grieving. And there are moments where we might experience that trauma again and then we go back to the grieving process so this is this is very important um you know, I know as me when i first onboarded a lot of the young people that we were serving were coming in in there and be like wow i, I really want to do what you're doing and and they see me in this higher position or this higher pedestal and i'm just like no i'm right here on the ground with you i still have my own struggles it's still um a difficult time you know so um this is a process of, of letting go of the hurt and translating that experience um, into something positive, something that benefits other young people, right? Um, and also, does that young person have the empathy and do they not judge? And are you able to still walk along with someone without judging and who's also overcoming their experiences, right? And also, being part of a community and that is what the young person needs to feel when they're coming into a new organization right they need to feel like they're being valued for their lived experience um, and they need to find a meaningful role within the organization whatever that may be it could be um, writing grants it could also be janitorial stuff you know whatever works out best for both the organization and the young people and um, i think the big message for me with this section is from when it comes to young staff to CEOs is to remember that we are human and we do get bogged down in um, our, our, our systems and we do forget that human connection piece. Like that is so important. And I've been amplifying this a lot lately because we, we, we have this conversation, the system, system, systems, and we never talk about the connection piece. That is the most important piece how a young person can heal and can overcome um, whatever it is that happened to them. Um, so just some actionable solutions that you can take right now um, is evaluating the true capacity and the culture of your work environment. Um, an unprepared conversation is potentially re-traumatizing. Um, initiate conversations during onboarding process and incorporate scheduled check-ins. Um, initiate difficult conversations that people avoid. Like Evie said, we, we avoid having these conversations because they are difficult, but they do need to happen, right? Um, provide some examples or answers to the questions that you're asking. And do your research, provide resources within and outside the organizations to best support your staff, right? Um, I say physical, emotional, and mental support is important. Physical, yeah. you can hire a masseuse to come in and, and give your staff a massage for 15 minutes once per week, or you can hire 
a therapist to come in and, and drop in to the office. And the staff has the choice if they do want to engage in that support or not. Um, and then teach the nuance between intention and impact, both mm. to the younger staff and to the existing staff. Um, and sorry, y'all, I have been talking a lot. So I want to pass it over to Andrew or, or any of the other facilitators, if you guys have something to chime in or to add in, anything I may have forgot. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Dejanay. Those are all amazing recommendations as well as things for us to think about, especially when you mentioned the intent versus the impact, right? That's something that's super important for us to reflect on. And something that you mentioned, you were like, I keep on saying trauma a lot, right? I keep on, I keep on talking about trauma. And so one way for us to also not only call out trauma or even just to see trauma as the end or as the constant, we want to move to the strategy that we put here, number six, which is moving towards a more healing centered approach. So we know that trauma has occurred, right? But we don't. So now what? Where, where are we moving towards or how can we together begin the healing process? And so I wanted to bring in this approach that I've practiced um, when I was a classroom teacher. I practiced this when I organized um, with youth advisory boards and even my work here at Point Source Youth. And so Sean Jinright, who um, is the person, uh, the professor at SF State who created this approach, defines a healing centered approach as holistic, involving culture, spirituality, civic action, and collective healing. A healing centered approach views trauma not simply as an individual isolated experience, but rather highlights the ways in which trauma and healing are experienced collectively. And so that's also bringing back to the point that Dejanay was mentioning that we're all humans. And so we're all in this process of dealing with trauma and healing and, you know, allowing us to lean into that and not telling folks to, oh, keep your baggage at the door. I, I, I often would hear that um, as other educators would tell students or young people like all of that drama, all of that mess that you're dealing with in your life. Uh -uh, don't bring that energy up in here. When really then we're not telling our young people to show up as their true authentic selves. And also, too, if we're not showing up as our true authentic selves, how is that also pushing us for as humans? And how is that also contributing to our healing process? So, you know, this healing centered approach is something that we uh, utilize here. I utilize it with our young people, and I definitely would recommend this strategy um, for others. All right, so structuring hiring application and selection process. Um, so our, before we talk about hiring, I, I do want to name that I think when we are when we're talking about switching to a trauma informed lens, if, if our organization is already operating out of that perspective um, and just hiring young people in general, I think it takes a commitment on the organizational level for real structural systemic change. Um, and it's not just like, oh, we're gonna have a conversation about our trauma and then what? Like, that, what, what did you do with that, right? So I think it takes from all of us and then folks on like the director, executives, the C-level, right? Those folks to, to be committed to create institutional change with it, which I think a lot of times is, is the biggest monster to face in, in the nonprofit world. Um, so with that said, um, when you are looking at application at the application process, you have to kind of rethink what you know about hiring and applications, right? Um, so a little question for you folks in the chat. Um, how do organizations develop protocols and structures to incorporate youth leadership and voice within the hiring application and selection process? Slide, Evie. Thank you. Um, so number one, rethink what you know about hiring. Um, when we typically hire, um, if you've ever been on the hiring end of things, you have like, you know, your little folks have resumes, you have your little questions, and you are trying to match a professional resume to the needs that you have for a position. 
um, when hiring young people, what you are doing is you are thinking about how that young person's whole personhood can add to the value of your organization and also how that person can thrive within your organization, right? So you're not looking at just like, I have a need and I need it filled. You're looking at, these are our needs and these are the needs of this young person. How can we marry those two in a way that feels good for this young person, right? That's not just like a checkbox or like, we know that you can do this job, but we understand that you're probably gonna leave here with five months worth of burnout and never wanna work in an organization again. Right. Um, so uh, some things to do in your applications or in the like job posting, make sure that you note that you are looking for people with lived experience. Um, what we have in our uh, job listing, we specifically put that professional experience and educational experience was not necessary and that having a high school diploma or any kind of degree was not necessary. We specifically included it there. We made it very, we bolded it. Um, and then we sent out that applicate that uh, job listing to organizations that we know work with young people, particularly young people that are facing some challenging situations. And in the email that we sent out that listing to, we put, please, we are looking for lived experience. <laughs> like if your young person thinks that they are not like that, they don't have what it takes or that they're not hireable, tell them that they're hireable. Like we want to talk to them. So we really went out of our way to like highlight that shift because most young people are not gonna think that that's the, the perspective that you're hiring from, specifically if that's a young person that's been living in trauma or has been struggling with being unhoused, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and doing adultism, um, and I, I wanna give some space for Evie definitely to, to talk about this, um, but as an adult, we think we know so much um, and we're so accustomed to doing the things that we do the way that we do them. Um, and sometimes when young people challenge those beliefs that we feel so much comfort in, we really struggle. Um, we struggle with being wrong. We struggle with what we perceive as like being challenged or as like an attack, right? And it's, it's not an attack. It's a different way of doing things. Um, if we can, all the adults here, if we can think back to when we were young people, we can probably think of the million ways that we were like, I, when I was young, I knew better. Like I would have done that better. When I was young, I was always like, my parents don't know nothing. They are dumb. I know how to do it the right way. And a lot of times I was right, right? I had a, a different, a new perspective. Um, and it is our job as the folks on the hiring end to ch basically like check our stuff at the door, right? Like what, what qualities have I assigned to my wisdom as an adult? Um, that are limiting the ways that I listen to young people. And I, I want to give them for anybody else on the panel. Chris, I just loved what you said so much. It's so powerful hearing you um, say that. And um, I, what I thought about as you were speaking is, um, treating young people like assets and not liabilities. Because I oftentimes, when I hear the conversation of like homeless kids or um, something along those lines who are not dressed to the way society sees young people, it's all, they're always seen as a liability. Like, oh, I don't wanna hire them because they might not show up to work on time or they might make us look bad. When in reality, these are the people who are on the ground that know is what's going on in the community. They know what the needs are. And these are the people that can really help improve the services that you are providing to young people. So again, I just wanna say this, like treat young people like assets and not liabilities. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for the folks in, in this space that are like gonna be doing hiring, so that might, this is, all of this is going to take extra work from you. It's pro it's it's worth it, I promise. Um, to your point, right, about folks not being dressed the way that you expect, I had to have a conversation with the older folks in my organization about crop tops, which I know sounds really funny, but we are hiring young people and we had a young person come in wearing a crop top. And the person that was interviewing with me was afterwards was like, you know, that's not professional. And I was like, let's unpack that. 
crop tops are a thing now. Like I had to have a whole conversation about that and teach this 60 something year old person, right? Like about evaluating, like, first of all, what professionalism means and then evaluating people's worth based on the fact that they're showing their belly button, right? Um, so it's, it, it is gonna take some extra work from us, especially those of us that are working in a spot where maybe like all of us are gonna have people fight us about this. I'm just gonna say that now. In your organization, you're gonna have people fight you about things. Like when you're hiring young people, they don't get it. Um, so our job as that middle person is to educate on both sides and that sucks. But when you educate up, then you're protecting your younger people from then having to either do that education, which they shouldn't have to be doing, or again, like re-traumatizing them, right? Um, which actually goes into my next point or into the next point about reducing power imbalance. Um, meet your young people where you are, where they are, and also like basically like put your money where your mouth is, right? If you're like, I'm trustworthy, I'm trustworthy, I'm trustworthy. And then they tell you something and then you flip the script on them, like you were lying, right? Um, and automatically then that redisrupts the power imbalance. So if you're trying to, to create this like connection where you're all in the same place um, and you cannot show up in that like equal balance for young people, you're gonna cause more harm. Um, and then also with discussing power imbalance, it, you also have to name the fact that like if you're somebody's manager, the the, the power is imbalanced, period. Um, and how you help that is by telling that young person the tools that they have to check you and what resource they, ha they have outside of you. So for the young people that I mentor, they have direct uh, connections and relationships with my supervisors. And they know, like, if you have an issue with me, these are the things that I need you to go do. And this is how I need you to handle it so that there is no confusion about how they can get support outside of me, so that there's no fear of retribution, so that there is no, like, oh, my God, well, I don't want to say anything about Chris because I don't want Chris to dislike me. Da -da 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 -da. No, give them the resources ahead of time so that if they have an issue with you, and they might, that they can get that solved without fearing for their income or whatever it may be. Um, safe space. I mean, I think that goes so much with like trauma informed care. Um, something that might be really helpful just as like, like an actionable, um, when you hire a young person, maybe gather your whole team because it's valuable for everybody on the payroll. Right. Um, and have a discuss like, Oh, Hey folks, we're going to have like a check-in about our work styles. Right. And ask some very poignant questions. Uh, what, what bothers you um, in a professional setting? What things make you feel small? What do people do or how can people address you in a way that makes you feel small? Um, what things, uh, let's talk about timelines. Uh, how do you feel about timelines? What's the best way for you to meet those timelines, right? Asking very poignant questions at the beginning um, helps create like a safe space long term because you're addressing those things ahead of time. Um, and finally, something that I'm working on, clearly define job expectations before, before, during, and after interview process. If I tell a young person, hey, you got four hours to work on this, do as much as you can. And then they did as much as they could in four hours and it was not my idea of what they should have done in four hours, is that their fault or my fault? That's on me because I did not set a clear expectation. I, I didn't, I made it vague and then I was frustrated by the outcome because of my lack of communication. But if I don't check myself, I'm going to turn it into, oh, they didn't work how they were supposed to. Right. Um, so over communicate, over explain. Um, I always tell the youth that I work with, I'm so sorry if I am over explaining. I'm going to be a dad about this. I'm going to tell you 20 times. It is for me to feel because that's my trauma response is for me to feel more secure that I'm communicating correctly. I'll leave it open for anybody else or slidey. Sorry, uh, I didn't realize I was muted earlier. Um, I loved all of that. That was great. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up about clearly defining job expectations, uh, something from my personal life. I was hired at Fred Myers, and the original job posting that I answered 
was for a stock position. So stock the shelves, clean up the aisles, make sure everything's great. However, at Fred Meyer's, they really were out of employees at the time. It was right after Christmas. You know, people just don't show up to work sometimes or they just leave that job because they don't need it anymore. They used it to get presents and that was it. And they all bugged off. So they would put stalkers on the cash registers or janitorial positions or the food area. Um, I got transferred out to gas station within the first week of having my job. and that wouldn't really work if you have a trauma or a different diverse youth because you say hey you're going to have this job these are the trainings you have and this is what you need to do to get those trainings done then about a week later oh by the way you're now going to be doing something completely different something you are not at all prepared for and we just expect you to do it the same way as you know you would your normal job and this does not work. I can tell everyone here that I've experienced change. Change is scary. I'm pretty sure we all have. And change one after another after another can lead to re-traumatization. Um, also, I really do appreciate what you said, Chris, about adultism and all that. Um, because young people might not have the right outfit. Or they might not have a bit on their resume that says, oh, I have this job for 17 years but they might also have the experience in that area kids are learning the darndest things in school these days so you can definitely see kids have the same area of expertise they just don't have that area of experience and you can give it to them if you hire them anyway uh unless there's anybody else to say anything i will slide So here we have modifying recruitment, outreach, and engagement. This is how to find and recruit young people, what areas to go, uh, how to get the word to spread out, what factors should we service in or should providers service in when looking for young people, where they are, and all that. We have a couple of different ways to, you know, a couple of different ways to spread word, to have word out there, places, things, people. We have Facebook, you know, online is a great, great way to reach out to people. Facebook, flyers online. Some people even do ads. And then there's always, of course, the job centers and all that. Uh, there's also like libraries. I have yet to see a library devoid of young people because... They are just a great source of internet, books, and fun. Just all around fun. And so you put up a couple flyers or a couple job postings on a cork board. And ta-da, you, um, you, you have recruitment done. Um, and unfortunately, that's how it goes. And sure, this leaves it open for other people to this leaves it open for other people to accept the job. But if you make yourself clear and keep an open mind, everything can work just as well as everything else. Sorry, I got a little bit distracted, but yeah. Um finally, another good place that I see internet cafes, Starbucks. Uh up here in Alaska, we have Kaladi Brothers which is basically Starbucks, but with better coffee, I say. But that's on me. And so you go there. You put up a couple flyers on the cork board. Kids come there for internet again, but also because coffee and good stuff. Good stuff, good friends, good food, good drinks. And then from there, you build. Uh, I was going to, yeah. Andrew can help fix the rest of that one. Oh, no, I was just going to add, I think that something that you mentioned that was super important is around uh, places, right? 
And I think it was mentioned in the chat, going to the places where young people are at, not expecting them to come to us or to find out about these opportunities. And I also wanted to address some comments in the chat talking about not just young people, but specifically about black young people or indigenous young people and how we want to make sure that we are also tapping into those existing communities to then leverage those resources, those connections and those networks. We're not saying that these networks and these resources don't already exist. So how can we utilize our community partners within the Black community or the Indigenous community or even thinking about um, even other demographics, right? Um, maybe young people with disabilities. How do we tap into those existing communities and supportive networks so that we are also being culturally relevant and being mindful in the way that we're connecting with them? And so that it's not just seeming again as exploitive. And you know what? I need to hire, you know, two youth of color. Let me just, let me just find them anywhere. We're really wanting to be intentional. So I just wanted to mention that because I know it's coming up a lot in the chat. Yeah, no, that's totally, um, that is totally true. Like, we also have that people group, and I have seen this a lot. Like, uh, what's the phrase? Birds of a feather flock together, right? So you're going to want to find areas, um, and this differs from town to town to town to town. Um, but most, for the most part, that's why I've, I personally think libraries are good because a library, you know, everybody can go. There's usually enough room for everybody. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's definitely a good idea, though. Good point. Um, just find where the young people are, though. Every town is different. Every area is different. Every group of people is different. You have to be flexible to uh, find anything in this world. And of course, navigating uh, low barrier, harm reduction, all that, what, what you need to do, not what you need, but what you could do is open up to other ideas um, instead of having a boss behind a closed door. You know, have some guy who open office policies. I like those technically or typically, but yeah, no have some guy who you can walk into your store, your hiring office, your whatever, who is always available, you know, during business hours, who can always be there and be like, Hey, I would like a job. Here is whatever I have. Can I get an interview at some time, set up an appointment? That's my whole point. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that I did want to mention on this slide before we move on to the next strategy, because I want to be mindful of time, is also the way in which we present our materials. So, for example, I'm in San Francisco and there's a big undocumented community here, as well as folks who are monolingual. And so recently we held a group of listening sessions to recruit young people to provide their experience. However, we knew that it, we wanted it to feel safe as well as inclusive to folks who don't speak English, primarily Spanish only speakers. So as a part of the recruitment, as well as the interview, as well as the selection, we made sure that all throughout there were Spanish speaking representatives and that they were the majority of the panel so that those young people didn't feel like they were already excluded. And when they walked in the door and they were asked questions and they were um, engaging with um, the session that it was all primarily in Spanish and that we didn't feel, uh, we didn't make them feel excluded. That was one thing that I definitely noticed um, in regards to recently. Um, and then also too, when thinking about, you know, going back to um, hiring black young people or even thinking about indigenous young people, who are folks on the hiring panel who are actually welcoming them at the front door, walking them into the room, asking them questions? Do those folks look like them? Do they do they can they identify um, with them? I think in the chat here was do they see themselves in that position? So those are also very important things when thinking about recruitment, outreach and engagement. Next slide. Okay, we are on strategy four, which is onboarding, communication, support, and supervision. Uh, the question we wanna ask you guys today is how do we create space for young people with lived experience 
to influence their job and du job duties, responsibilities, schedule, payment methods, oh. etc. Um, next slide. Thank you, Evie. Um, and I'll go ahead and kick us off, Chris, and then pass it over to you. Um, so to me, when I think of onboarding, um, I always think of the application process, the hiring process, um, just um, exactly what Evie was just talking about. And to me, the most important piece of this process is communication and transparency. Um, I think everyone in general has a lot of anxiety. Um, there's lack of clarity. There's so much stress during the interview process when trying to get a new job, right? Everyone felt that before. And things are just up in the air. No one has any idea what will happen. You start questioning yourself, am I good enough? Am I even qualified for this job? And then it leads to like some, some self-doubting um, after, after you haven't heard back from um, the job for a while. So I think um, as an organization, ongoing communication is very important from the very beginning. Like, hey, this is our current hiring process. It may take X amount of time to actually hire you if you are chosen for this position. Um, explain that, you know, this is the um, internal process um, and communicate that to that young person. Um, this whole piece right here completely falls through the crack after the first interview. Like I know when I interviewed first, I was like, okay, how long is this gonna take? When am I gonna hear back? Like, oh my gosh, they're probably hiring someone else already. And um, I think this will reduce a lot of anxiety. Um, it will still tell the person like, hey, we do value you. You are very qualified for, for this position. So I think providing reassur reassurance that they are valued and they are qualified enough um, to step into this role is super important. And then I think once a young person is hired, a big piece of this work, um, and I'm looking back and I do a lot of, um, I'm sharing a lot, a lot of, from my personal experience is like knowing the common language, but also understanding the language in this profession, right? We have all these acronyms. We have um, words internal, we have words externally, we have words that the federal government uses when we're trying to apply for grants. And so um, teaching this young person that that language um, is super important uh, for them and also to showing up as, as their most professional self, right? So skill development is essential when trying to grow within an organization and for their own personal career development. I think the directors and the higher ups need to be very intentional, intentional with their support and their supervision uh, when working on individualized development, whatever that young person is looking to develop, right? And also providing opportunities to see what's happening on the back end of the organization. How are we being sustainable? How am I being paid right now? This, it's like the exec team has this conversation and no one else knows what's happening, right? Teach the young people what a board of directors is and how that's impacted the decision-making process, um, how they can even get on the board if, if they want to get on a board. Um, Again, how's organization sustainable? What types of funding are sustaining these services? And how am I being paid? What am I being paid out of? Um, you know, explaining those types of funding, federal funding, private foundation funding, restricted, unrestricted. Like these are so important to know when you're coming into the nonprofit world. Um, mm -hmm. And also as when the young person is trying to develop and trying to move on, um, move into a higher position, right? Um, maybe they want to implement a type of program. Maybe they want to write a grant and just create a whole new program. And so having that transparency is super important. And again, just being very intentional when developing leadership and professional skills in your young staff. And I'll pass it over to Chris because I know we're short on time right now. Yeah, no, Dejane, you covered it, dog. Uh, I think I think we're good for the next slide, Evie, unless anybody has anything else. This, oh, go ahead, Dejanae, I seen you. Okay, hand. yeah, sorry. <laughs> One last thing, because I did have that note right directly on the slide, is, and I, I think someone said it in the chat, is like, young people really don't feel comfortable all the time coming up and asking for help, asking for support. 
um, asking questions. Um, I know I'm, I'm very thankful for Andrew because when I don't want to just ask the whole entire team, I'm like, Andrew, hey, how do we do this? And so um, just creating that space for the young people to feel safe and comfortable enough to come uh, ask you questions or ask for support. And I even heard, saw someone say, when um, just give salary raises, right? Without the young person having to come ask you for that. I felt like that was really big mm. and it was really inspiring for me to see. Um, and we can go to strategy five. So this is strategy five, talking about leadership development and mentorship. And this was briefly touched upon in the past, but we uh, in in the past slides. But we wanted to have it be its own strategy. And so the question that we would like to pose to the audience is: How do we how do we develop pipelines, bridges, and or internship programs for young people with lived experience to be able to move up? in higher senior executive positions, if obviously that's what they're looking to do and or maybe even just move beyond this organization, because we also know that young people would like um, positions and opportunities in various fields. Next slide. Evie, did you want to go ahead and take the lead on some of these and I can go ahead and piggyback? Sure. So, um. Obviously, I'm not uh, pretty far in the world myself, but I do. I did pick up a couple of things. One is teach what you were taught or what you wish you were taught. Specifically, um, presenting, like, say you, when you started your job, you, most of us probably didn't have any idea how to interview or when you got on the job, you kind of lose things. Um, they say, oh, we're supposed to do it this way and then never explain why or how. So teach what you wish they would have shown you. Show people, hey, there's a, uh, there's this that helps you get this file submitted easier. Or there's this program that will help you through this amount of paperwork that you have. Because a lot of us have a lot of paperwork. Um, so just show things that make made your life easier at that stage because a lot of people will definitely take this and maybe even find a better way to do it makes things a lot simpler um andrew do you have anything for that no i love that i think that this something that i also wish that i was taught is the ability or the importance or even how exhausting sometimes code switching can be. So just like Chris had mentioned around professional dress, quote unquote, right? And so I think that it is very important and powerful to allow me to dress however I feel like I, I, I can and I want to show up that way, right? And I think it's also important to then uh, educate or at least provide knowledge around how in different spaces that might not be accepted and how we should be aware of that. Not saying that we need to conform, but being aware is super important because I remember also the way in which I spoke when I was a young person, I noticed how some people would not take me as seriously or they would just deem me as a brown young person trying to yell. Right. And so it was a mentor who taught me the ability and the importance and the benefits of code switching, whether that was my dress, my my how I spoke um, or even how to present or write an email. Those were all super important and powerful for me. And so um, my mentor teaching me that um, is something that I definitely um, have a discussion with the young people I work with as well. That was great. The um, next thing about teaching right? Something that I've noticed is they very, very rarely teach you how to go up. They teach you how to do your job and do your job well, and that's it. Hopefully you get a promotion. Unfortunately, sometimes that's not how that works, and it shouldn't be how that works. You should only take what you can handle, but it shouldn't just be you are hoping to get a promotion. Talk to your employees. Talk to your youth. Be like, hey, I have a position coming open, and I think you would be good for it. Uh, would you be interested in applying for it? Give them that chance to move up, as well as give them that chance to say, hey, I don't think I can. 
I don't think I'm ready. Both moving up and staying stagnant still are both great if that's what you need. Um, however, along with this, you need access to your mentors, to your uh, bosses, to your supervisors, all of that. Um, personally, I liked at the food bank I worked at on the Kenai. It was a great open door policy. So they had a bunch of employees, a bunch of people, and they had an open door policy where twice a week, uh, it was Tuesdays and Fridays, twice a week you could go in, have a little talk with the boss, either it be about how you're doing, how you think something could be implemented, or, hey, I'm having this issue, can you help me? And this allowed not only for things to get done, but also to kind of have a place where you can go and feel safe. Everything was taken care of in either a discreet manner, if need be, or in a more open training. And it definitely helps to just let everybody know and stay on one page exactly what's happening. Um, we're running kind of short on time, so is there anything else anybody would like to add? Evie, I would love for you to mention number five. I think that's super important. That was something that you had recommended as a possible training that I think should be elevated. Yeah. So number five is one thing I have run into. As I've said previously, they throw information at you, expect you to learn it, and expect you to get it done. Um, training time for Walmart was three days. You had three days to learn everything you were expected. And that's just horrible. You need some trainings for people who pick up fast. You need some trainings for people who have to do it hands-on. They have to get up and flip the switches themselves or press the buttons, work the cash register themselves before they're ready. Or you have some people who, you know, they need everything. They need to read it, they need to see it, and they need to practice at it. And this is all okay. You just need to be willing to listen. Listening is the biggest key to any communication. It's not communicating. It's hearing what the other person is saying, at least in my opinion. Um, but that's what I got for that. Anybody else? Um, I will add one, one last thing on that point. Um, I think a lot of times we talk about folks that are neurodivergent or have a different set of abilities. We talk about we always talk it in the frame of the negative. Oh, we have to create access. Oh, we have to accommodate for this, da, 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 da. Instead of looking at like, folks that are neurodivergent have this like huge skill set that a lot of us don't have, right? So instead of being like, oh, I have to, I have to accommodate this person, no. How can I use the strengths of, these, of this person that is underused for their own growth and for the growth, growth of the organization? So just that slight reframe helps in, in getting everybody else on board as well. That might be like a pain to work with. Okay, I, I do know we're short on time. So we're on strategy six, which is compensation of methods of payment. And my our question to you today is how do we develop a feedback tool to provide youth input and recommendations within the compensation and method of payments discussion. Next slide, please. Um, so determining wages is like a hot topic right now, right? So determining equitable wages is part of what the young person can bring into the organization. Um, to, to me, young people, they bring in flavor, they bring in the culture, they bring in the youth, right, that is needed um the trending slangs that are happening they they bring in empowerment and they inspire the other young people that you are serving right they they bring in knowledge that cannot be taught to anyone else right it's within them and so to me they're when a young person when you are hiring a young person they're bringing in their whole self they're investing their time into your organization putting their physical, emotional, and mental self into your organization. And that, to me, is oftentimes not taken into account when 
when uh, wages are being determined, right? People look at their work history, their degrees. Um, but young people with lived experience, like I said, bring in, brings you back to ground and into back to reality of what is really happening out there. And they can really identify the, the trending needs of young people. Um, they also bring in street savvy. I, I just wanted to say that, right? Honest morals. People who have experienced traumatic events, they are very honest people to me, right? They, they, they just kind of bring you back. They just ground you, right? Because you're just like, dang, you just really went through all that. And look at you. You're here. You're still working towards um, becoming your better self. And they just bring in that holistic approach. Um, and that's necessary to serve young people. Um, and take into account something that is special when you do have this young person that does want to work for your organization. And I do like to use Kobe as an example, like no matter how other athletes train, um, no matter how much work they put in, they will not be better than him, right? It's in him. Um, and nobody could take that away from him, just like nobody could take the experience away from the young people. And the developing pipelines uh, for young people to move up within an organization is super important because oftentimes um, when you when you are overcoming homelessness, you can only see one or two ways out. When in reality, there are so many open doors that that you can walk through. And I think as a director or an executive, um, you should tell the young person that, right? Like share your knowledge, be that mentor to the young person because your words and your guidance carry a lot of weight to the young person who's overcoming homelessness. Um, Cause oftentimes young people like, I believe Andrew said this, they can't even fathom the idea of, of being in a director position or seeing themselves in the position that you are. But when you believe in them and they see it and they feel it, they will start to believe in themselves and, and the sky becomes a limit. And um, that opens many doors for them. And I know I'm just talking about wages, but um, uh, yeah, I just wanna be super mindful of time. Uh, that, that was all I had to share. If any other facilitators had anything to share, please feel free. No, that's super important, Dejeuner. And this is this strategy and compensation is a super important topic in general. And we can have a whole workshop on this. But one thing that I did want to mention that was elevated in the chat is that it also starts at the grant writing process. So let's also make sure that these grant writers are writing into the grant to equitably pay our young people. I'm so tired of being given a grant and then being expected to pay the young people a part of that program crumbs or gift cards because it wasn't written in the grant for them to get an equitable pay. So if we're going to really truly stick by this, then we need to make sure that from the inception to asking for the money, to writing for that money, we need to make sure that that's already budgeted. Because I don't want to hear at the end, that, oh, we don't got no money or, oh, we, you know, we don't got in the budget, wasn't accounted for. Well, then maybe we shouldn't be doing this program. Maybe we shouldn't be running this then until we make sure that these young people are adequately paid. So I want to stop there because I don't want to take too much time. Um, but I just wanted to mention that because I definitely seen that in the chat. And that is something that we are consistently um, trying to make sure that we address is from that grant writing process. Let's go ahead and go on to the last strategy, strategy seven, which has to deal with offboarding, transition, as well as warm handoff. And so the guiding questions here are, you know, did we help youth gain experience in the desired field that they wanted? Did we help youth gain experience toward their life goals that they've identified? Really trying to think about it in this holistic aspect and also trying um, remembering that this isn't the last chapter. This isn't the end all be all for this young person. They, they are they're going to be going off and doing amazing things. And this is just that launching pad. So wanting to make sure I mean, if they want to. Right. Because we also want to create sustainable options as well. Next slide. And so this is something that Point Source Youth, as well as a lot of organizations, are currently grappling with. And so we would love some ideas and feedback. Um, and so this is we want to first include the youth in this input process, right? Include them in what they would like to see as an offboarding and or transition process. Not us just assuming because it was done this way, because at our last job or because this field 
technically or, or, or typically does this. We're, we're not doing that. We're, again, rethinking about how the systems that we have been put through. Um, youth are, ready, are, are prepared for this transition and that they have the adequate time um, to think about this transition, right? We want to also make sure that we're not just ending and it's like, all right, cool. Thank you. You're wrapped up. As of the first, you're done. So good luck. We really want to make sure we're having these checkout meetings. We're closing the loops. We're making sure that folks are transparent about this state. They should never, it should never be a surprise that their contract or that their time and or position or grant is ending. They should definitely be aware that as soon as they come on boarded, we should allow them to understand the timeline because that's also what that transparency and then, you know, what Dejeuner was mentioning in regards to work plan, making sure that the work plan is definitely youth centered and youth driven, making sure that the young person identifies where it is that they would want to go and what they want support with. And where is it that we can support them on their next step, if not here at this organization? And so these are some of the strategies or some of the recommendations that we have came up with, but I also wanted to just open it up to the facilitators. Are there any other ideas in regards to offboarding, transition, and handoffs? Because I know this is a big topic that we were discussing. I also had one and I throw it on there. Um, so I see in the chat as well, grievance processes throughout. I think this is a very important thing that a lot of employers miss is um, I've had experience where an employer will just basically say, okay, bye. And even though you're leaving because there was an issue at that workplace, they're not going to do anything about it. They're just happy to see you at the door. They'll, they'll give you the boot before they give you the, uh, the satisfaction of thinking you've changed something. And unfortunately that's, that's the world we live in right now, but we can change that. We can hire young people. We can get to a better spot. We can make our systems better. And it starts by hearing, hearing what other people have to say. Next slide. And so we wanted to end here. We really wanted to allow the audience to be able to share maybe any other ideas and or best practices when hiring young people with lived experience, or maybe even elevating some of the practices and or ideas that were shared today during this training. Um, if folks want to go ahead and maybe drop in the chat some ideas or even just elevate um, some of the ideas that were shared. And while folks are um, dropping some of their best practices in the chat, I saw a couple of folks talking about budgets and grant writing, and I've advocated so long that young people need to be writing these grants and need to be on the back end of this. Um, because um, fortunately for the organization I was working with, they were very transparent about the budget. They're like, if you need more funding, then you go out there and you write that grant. And mm -hmm. I was like, hey, thank you. They're putting the power into my hands. They're like, mm -hmm. if you want to take the initiative, you do it. And I just see so many times organizations, there, there's confusion about the budget. There's no transparency. They're like not telling the young people what the budget actually is. And I just find it, I, I don't understand it, basically, um, because it's very easy to just show a budget and share that. And I know we have one minute, so I'll stop talking. Oh, don't worry. I was just putting up the resources and materials. So this is contact information and all that. Um, my email uh, is a youth action board email. Uh, send me questions. Uh, I'll probably send out the slideshow through there as well, just to be safe and, you know, get everybody what, what everybody would like. Chris or any other facilitators, would you all like to share some last words? Thank you all for joining us today. Raina, I, I love your comments. Go ahead. I love the support. Um, the facilitators, I loved working with you all. Again, just thank you so much. I just learned a lot even from co-facilitating this. So thank you.
And one last thing that I will say is that Point Source Youth is working on developing a handbook on best practices on how to hire and support young people with lived experience. If you're interested in being involved in that handbook or developing or even helping the con uh, in contributing ideas as well as examples to this handbook that will be shared as a training tool nationally, please feel free to reach out to Point Source Youth. We are, would love to collaborate with CBOs who are doing this work in their own communities. Yes, love it. Thank you. I'm already seeing some folks in the chat who are down to contribute and to be involved. Yes, please. Um, and so at the end of the conference, you will be given a survey with contact information. So definitely feel free to go ahead and utilize our information here on the slide or um, when that's emailed to you after at the end of the conference. Chris, did you have any last words? Just wanting to open up space. Uh, nothing major, just like for any of you that are looking into hiring young people, like, it, it, listen, it's passion work. It's, it can be really challenging. Um, but all of the upfront effort that you put into making sure that you are personally ready and that your organization is ready um, is worth it. And like you will, the investment that you're putting in, you're going to get back. So do it. Yes, I love it. I love in the chat, there's a lot about investments, protecting the investments, valuing the investments. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining today's training on hiring and supporting youth with lived experience. We hope you had um, an informative um, as well as engaging time. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day at the conference as we head to our last plenary. Thank you, everyone. And Andrew, if I'm correct, we'll be joining the main stage. Exiting yes, so we will be wrapping up here in this session, and then we will be joining the, the, la uh, the last plenary. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Evie. Thank you, Dejanay.